Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to the Graduate School of Architecture uh, practice lecture series. Um, this evening we have the pleasure of introducing Kate Otten who will be speaking about her practice, talking about her experiences as a practitioner and giving us uh, some insight into how Kate Otten Architects works. And um, it's part of a series of lectures that we've been convening here at the school. We've had a number of them already. We've had Dixon Aduaje, who's a lecturer at the GSA and an architect in practice, and Kalisi Makubo. Um, we had two weeks ago Isabel Jolica joining us from Haiti. And last week, a fascinating presentation by Tan Zimrazak and Althea Peacock. And as I said, we have Kate Otten with us this evening. Um, for those of you who are attending and would like to get CPD points, um, at the end, Boitamelo Masipuko will post in the chat the link that you can follow in order to register for the CPD points. And during the course of Kate's presentation, if you have any questions or if you have any comments or any thoughts that you'd like to share, please feel free to share them in the chat and I'll definitely relay those to Kate after the lecture. And you'll, you can also raise your hand and ask her a question directly. We'll, we'll kind of freestyle it at the end with the, with the Q&A uh, as we normally do. Uh, but now moving on to the, the main program, um, it's really great pleasure to introduce Kate. Uh, Kate is one of South Africa's preeminent architectural practitioners. She's been in practice uh, for a while and has many, many prestigious commissions um, to her name. And she has also um, maintained an international presence, participating in events many places in the world, most recently at the Venice Biennale as part of the um, presentations there and the work there. She made a, a fabulous presentation that she spoke to students here about a few weeks ago as part of their making program. She's also served as an external examiner at the GSA and is a, a friend and ally in the work that we do here. Uh, she established, established her own practice a year after graduating it, and it has become one of South Africa's most recognized practice with a varied and prolific body of work, um, including also public buildings and places of memory. And she's also been the recipient of many awards and also recently served as the president of the South African Institute of Architects. Um, but I'm sure you're all eager to, to hear what Kate has to share with us. So I'm going to hand over to Kate now, and she's going to take the floor and turn on her presentation, introduce herself. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. I'm going to shoot straight ahead. Um, I've got 40 minutes and 40 years of practice or making or getting to be in practice to share with you. So we're on quite a tight schedule. So... This talk this evening is about how I, Kate Otten, became Kate Otten Architects. And this is a collection of people who've worked for Kate Otten Architect, been part of Kate Otten Architect over the last, it's now 35 years old, but I think the practice started effectively for me sometime before that. Going back to my first and second year, which was in um, KwaZulu-Natal, just before we start this though, I just want to say that tonight's show or, or, or slide presentation, I really have tried hard not to put any photographs of buildings other than the ones that I um, that were part of the of the practices of the studios where the practice has been um, has inhabited. Um, and to show you lots of drawings and kind of process rather than to show you about the actual buildings. So um, back to the slide on hand, which is Hassan Fati, who is an Egyptian architect now passed many years ago, um, but he was very influential in my first, when I first started architecture. His very beautiful buildings, the kind of sensual nature of them, the quality of light, etc. And also um, the Islamic architecture that I became very interested in as a student, as a kind of alternative canon to the Western one that we were always taught at university then. Um, and how there were, uh, I, I suppose, Islamic architecture was also kind of well covered in uh, books, etc., and that there was a lot of writing and research having been done about it. So there was kind of um, a way that I could access an alternative, an alternative voice. Um, and then to my prakya, which was where I worked for Muhammad Mayed, and uh, while working for him, 
we did these mosques up in Malawi, and I had the great privilege of going to Malawi to build these mosques. And this here is a is a copy of the book that I made as my third year project or fourth year project. Sorry, fourth year project. We had to do a kind of summary of what we'd, do, we'd been doing in the year, and it was all a kind of study of mosques. Um, and so through this presentation, you'll see that there are differences. So, for example, I wrote every page by hand. I drew every page by hand. These ones are not even photostatic. The original is what was submitted. So I just think there's this kind of process that I'm also trying to uh, represent that's very different to how anybody is practicing right now. Um, it was also the 80s when I was studying. So this is a, a, a model of the mosque. The, the roof comes off. We took it with us to Malawi. Um, and there is the mosque under construction. And sunbreak bricks, uh, mud bricks. And really just an incredibly uh, rich experience um, and started a really keen interest for me in architecture, which bizarrely had not till that date existed. Um, also influential in my early years was Pancho Gedish who was, when I was at Wits University, our um, head of school. And in fact, my year was the last year he had Pancho as the head of school. And I'll just read this for you. So, Pancho. I claim for architects their rights and liberties that painters and poets have held for so long. And I just think it's so wonderful. Pancho had this kind of incredible, he was incredibly gifted and just a, a, an amazing sort of energy. Um, and he believed that architects were kind of all things, including that we could, as as architects, we were entitled to get 100% if, in fact, so he claimed for architects what mathemat mathematicians could do, which was achieve full marks. He reckoned architects could do this too. And I was fortunate enough to be, um, what's the word, bestowed, that 100% was bestowed upon me. And you can see here some of the pages of my thesis which was a whole urban continuity set in um, near where the plaza is now and down in Newtown of Johannesburg. And um, you can see kind of where my practice starts, the script, my own script, which was ma made into um, embossed letters on the cover of my thesis and the whole thing of making an original that you then photostated. So um, this is a few of the pages of the of the book and then one or two of the drawings of the book. Now, it should be known that I did my entire document in six weeks. So, students, <laughs> if you put your mind to it, you can do it. And all of these drawings are hand-drawn. Um, in many ways, you can't really see it on the screen, but there's this incredible um, energy around how hand-drawn drawings, so all drawn on a drawing board with a uh, rotring IHE preferred Faber-Castell, 0.18 pens. Um, and you can see the text, which is where it kind of started. So running concurrently with this or, or kind of in this period of my life, there's a very important world that I created called the public, the Pineapple Republic. Um, and the Pineapple Republic in many ways was an escape from, from the 80s, from the kind of um, apartheid South Africa that we we're living in and to make my own kind of um, safe space where I could feel comfortable and not have to participate. Well, not have to have that as my value system on a daily basis. So the pineapple, so I was always called carrot tops at school, but I failed to understand why since my hair is not green. And as you can see, forms a much better pineapple than it does carrot. And that is the national flag of the Pineapple Republic. I was the president. Albert the dog was the chief of militia who had the, um, well, I suppose, reputation for having taken out an apartheid policeman who jumped over my fence when he was not supposed to. And our um, Independence Day celebration table about to start. And there is a drawing of 
my my world, the world that I created so that I could have an existence within this really cruel and violent 80s. Um, and it's quite an homage, if you like, to Hassan Fati. You see the arrows. Oh, good. You can see the goose flying north. Um, the, the elevations that are flopped down um, and all the creatures with whom I live with who all come with me, you'll see them as we go through the different places that these creatures have come and traveled. The snake on the left being the one that has come. It's a Gazan Tlungwani carving. The one on the right hand side made by a friend called Mario and a one kind of connecting the two buildings that was made by the building team who built the studio. And so after my thesis, after a year of travel and having worked very, no, it was not a year of travel, after having worked for a year for a few architects and then traveled a bit, I started my practice. Um, and Josephine Moussi, who's in the image there, was, you know, purportedly the person who did cleaning at my house, but she was kind of so much more. And we had this very long and interesting conversation over many years. I read in Dava my children. And so it was a discussion that she and I had about the meaning of that and the kind of understanding of the more African history. And after some time and some projects that came to be, I started with absolutely nothing except, as you know, the photostat machine. Um, Sue von Lochenberg came to join us, and so she was my first office employee. And the three of us had a pretty wonderful time. There are the two of us in the office. Take note of that box, the photostat machine, and also this filing cabinet up at the top. So we had, which you'll probably see, sorry, you would have seen in that drawing, drawing boards, no computers at this stage at all. And that was to continue for many years. Um, and the kind of process that I was engaged in at this stage and for a long time thereafter was that I had always a building team. Um, we would do work either for me creating these, uh, what I call constructions for self, which are buildings that I've made for myself, the kind of big grand experiments, um, or my family, or um, and they are mostly where the office has been, not always, but mostly. And they were kind of testing grounds for unusual oh, and like, interesting so much older. construction methods, always on an incredibly tight budget. So if you see this waving ceiling, the ceiling that's or the roof that is like a um a kind of a curved, and um, you see it in this image where it kind of zigzags along. So instead of having to have very complicated roof of corrugation iron, corrugated iron and box gutters and the likes, all I did was create a lean-to roof that kind of continued to follow the slope. And then I did it, as you see at the bottom image there, with curves. So this was kind of the beginning of how I used a lot of, or we used a lot of um, reused building materials, cheap local building materials and skills and did interesting things with them. You see the roof there in profile and also using on the left hand side, you see in this tower materials in their raw condition. So the pursuit of, of things done cheaply, but also with this incredible effect and energy. But it wasn't all kind of madness and building. There were systems at play. And I love this little book. It's called Job List. And it dates back to 18, 8901, the first job I ever had. 9001, 9002. And you can see as the practice grew, so the pages got folded out. We still to this day have this book. And I'm the one who gives the project's numbers. And if they're special, they'll get 07 or, or 13 or 1. Um, we had our retro CAD, which I think Selma posted, but that was the that's what we used. And a drawing board. We had Letraset. If you were really rich, you got you had Letraset and you could burnish these images onto your drawings. 
And then having come from KZN, I had a Blakey Johnson Builder's Manual, which was absolutely important. You could get, we've just got a few copies of the page, but it's about 150 pages long and you get timber sizes, timber door sizes, standard uh, steel doors, how to do timber joinery, how to do it's waterproofing. It's a complete master manual that I have often offered up to people in my office. Continuing on with the systems, our letterheads, always the creature, the rat, the snake, and now the chicken. Don't know why the rat. We always made Christmas cards. I love the giraffe as the sort of gift bearer and the chicken on the head. And then my Filofax, my, still with me, still each year. For some reason, I keep these. I think I think it's a sort of legal obligation to keep a record of what it is you've done. Our workloads list. So it started out with great enthusiasm where every Monday morning we would have an office meeting and we'd go through all the different projects we had to do, who was doing what, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's kind of petered out to probably once a month. Um, but yeah, we still got them. And then the calendar, so the year at a glance. And, you know, they're full of tipics and you know, when we went to the farm on the right hand side and just so that there's a general impression and this is what I use on a day to day basis. But the beginning of the practice, there were also these really dull warehouses and maybe I need to sort of step back a little bit as to why I started the practice or perhaps I'll, I'll go in that a bit further forward. But this here is at the beginning, I was doing these warehouses. You'll see there's this interesting company that none of you know about called Otten Associates. And the other associate theoretically in my practice was somebody, my uncle, also sharing the name Otten. But he had this theory that I need to sound like I was more than just one woman. And um, to this day, I, it kind of irks me, but it's what I did. I earned some money doing these. And I learned an extraordinary thing, which is that you can span 25 meters, look at this, without any columns. So even though it was boring, it, it created funds for the office. And I learned about structures and what they can span. So that enabled various projects like this one, for example, which is um, House Row, which happened over many years. But again, you can see um, the drawings that are hand drawn on a drawing board. And then the wonderful processes on site are kind of very hands on working with directly with contractors. This, for example, is a heavily overplastered tower that we then hose down so that those rivulets kind of make the quality of the pasta or reusing bottles um, to let light come through, which you can see in that image. Very close relationship also with craftspeople and um, making of, of things for buildings. So the first project that ever won an award for me was this one, House Stoudy, which is in Melville, um, and designed to be like the top of the copy. It's hilarious, there's across the road, there's a copy of it now. They've made their wall look like this. It's very funny. Um, but this was quite sophisticated in that the curves of the roof were put through a roller. So unlike how I did my roof as a lean-to, these, the actual sheets, were put into a curve. Um, and again, the hand drawings, which if you look, mine's covered, but it says drawn by KO down over here. And so this was me on the drawing board. And I think also that there's an interesting thing where there's a translation between a design and a working drawing. And if you are in charge of that process, how that changes and how, how I suppose for me, I've needed to be really careful as things have moved into being computerized, not to lose touch of what's happening with the drawing and to draw over them repeatedly and iteratively. Um, so this is this building was a was a structure that was on top of an existing structure. So therefore, the the top floor was done as a lightweight timber structure, which was quite unusual to do in a in a a house of this of this kind. 
um, and very difficult to find people who were willing to do it. But nonetheless, we did manage. And there you can see the curves all set out. And then it won an award, so I got very excited and I made this collage to go on the exhibition of, of all the projects, which I just think is really, I mean, if you go to, to awards that have been given by SIA these days, you kind of get these printed posters, which I think are, perhaps they don't have quite as much energy. And while all of this was going on some time back, I bought the slither of land in Melville, which was later to become what you may know now as Lulu Kati Kati. But while we were building it, we stayed in the kind of concrete bunker, as some describe it, which was a very lovely studio that Michael Sutton, famous in his time in South African architecture, um, had built. And so we stayed in that. And there was myself and Adriette now. Sue had left the country and um, they were now, we were the two, we were the practice. And Adriette, because we were living on this mountain and we needed to get people to know where to go, we produced this drawing, which became, became a kind of a card that we gave to all our clients so they could come the route we did, which was take your life in the hands and over the rickety bridge and down the stairs or up this massive number of stairs and into the building while we looked down on the structure that was being built, which in this drawing is this. This on the right would become later Lulu Kati Kati, and you can see how things have changed. So Adriette did these incredible drawings. This was a house for Percy that he didn't build, but nonetheless, there's this amazing kind of fantastical drawing. And this, which is a house for Khadija, which again, fantastic drawing with all these wonderful colors. And I'm always in awe of the kind of energy of these drawings, and I miss them, I have to say. And so eventually we went to move in 68 Sixth Avenue, which bizarrely never got a name. And we were there for 12 years. And these are the various people, including Althea and Tanzi, who you would have heard last week, um, who came through the office, Ilsa Wolf, Wolf, sorry, Brendan Hart, um, who all at various points in time, we all had worked for either Mohammed Maya, Jonah Hero, or me, and sometimes all of the above. Um, and it was like a pointy, pointy. Um, and so this was an incredible, it was 12 years, which is probably the longest we ever stayed in an office. Here is Adriette's drawing on my, that's my pencil box. This slides out, you can see the pencils peeping through there. And Adriette did this really beautiful oil on my pencil box, which I just love. Um, this is again that same drawing. And now this has changed and grown up a little bit. And you can see then the working drawing. So we were in the concrete bunker next door while we watched this being constructed. And then all those various people moved through in and out of this office over the period of the next 12 years. It was also the time when I had my daughter Paloma and then Three or four women in the office also had babies. So it was very much this kind of baby boom. Um, and at the same time, an incredible boom of work. Um, this is the group of people, the builders who built that structure, along with Boba Jan, who eventually met his fate on a funeral pyre. It was a kind of weird afternoon on a Friday. But this is the building that they built from the stone of the site. There you can see the creatures have all come with us from the other parts of Melville have come back down now to join us in this new building. And so this was post, so again, also using all the materials in their raw condition or, or samples or ends of lines or whatever it is. So this period of time was, when I say it was sort of the baby and the boom period, so we were all having babies with this wonderful, ability to be able to do that and have these amazing women stay home and look after our babies for us, which I think was and is an incredibly liberating thing. I was 36 when I had Paloma and I could not have done what I did without three very wonderful women who over the years looked after Paloma. And 
It was also post 94. And so for the very first time, we had this international competition, which was the um, constitutional court competition. And so one of the reasons that I started my own practice was also because of the times and time in which I started my own practice, where you had a kind of, if you were part of the Brunerbund, you got work. If you were, um, I mean, it was definitely white male preserve, a lot of the work that was going on at that time. Um, and I also think that a lot of the sort of, like you could be on a roster but and, and get work that way from the government, but it was all from a racist regime. And I chose not to be part of that, um, which was, I think, quite a courageous thing to do a year out of us to you start your own practice. But it turned out it was the most brilliant idea I ever had. And I have to say, it's been a wonderful, wild roller coaster, and it's been amazing. And this competition is one of the many competitions that we did post-94. Um, Loan was part of this, and Adriette also. And we were allowed four A1 pages. And this was our design here for the new constitutional court with these little vignettes down the side. There's a 3D of the constitutional court, the plans along the bottom, a section through the whole site going up, and then um, kind of colouring in. I mean, you can't see it in detail, but how we... Uh, so you could sort of see the... get a sense of the fabric of the area in the, in the way that we submitted it. Janina and Andrew won that design workshop. We we didn't with Eric Ortz Hansen. Um, another one of the competitions that we did was the Accord Peace Centre, which we did with uh, Jenny and Nina from KZN, and friends of mine from KZN. And um, we actually, it was never built, but we were joint winners with design workshop on this one. And again, all... Well, I think some of these drawings were done on AutoCAD. I think we just got AutoCAD, but all these drawings on the side here were all kind of hand drawings and models. I've got very few pictures of models, but models were very much part of the whole, um, you know, way that we've made buildings over time and made presentations to our clients. So also, this was the time of the women's jail, and this is just a sketch of the women's jail, and then off um the screens that I did um of that. And so post 94 there was a lot of kind of positive um reclamation, if you like, of reclaiming of South Africa and of amazing public buildings and an opportunity for for young ambitious architects, which there hadn't been previously unless you were of a certain ilk. Um, one of the other competitions that we did was this, which was the um, Reptile Centre for the Zoo, which we won. But if you go to the zoo, which they never built, but if you go to the zoo, you will see that they built various very diluted, if you go to the snake part, you'll see bits of this. Um, the Zanin Waterfront Development, which we did, also won. Again, it didn't get built, but we did lots and lots of competitions and with this extraordinary kind of energy. And I'm showing you this because I love how each project got its own energy and its own particular, um, you know, the, uh, the craft market even got its own typeface, its own font, and how through the work, this kind of connection with artists, these were all, all designed by um, Marco Shanfinelli, and um, how all of the, the, so the craft and art, how that was very much part and parcel of how the projects were designed and conceptualized and how we worked. This is International House and the drawings, which would have been drawn on a drawing board, then the text put, uh, printed, cut out, stuck on, you can still see shadows, a little bit of shadow of it being stuck on then printed on this kind of parchment paper and then colored in. And I think just an incredible richness that we are really struggling to find on a computer. So, so I did these drawings by uh, on a drawing board and then colored them all in. And this is International House at Wits University, the very first project I ever did. 
orbits um, and the 3D of that. At the same time, also, we were involved in the um, Parkhurst shops. This was the first lot that we did. And I think what all of these buildings do that this building certainly does is around kind of getting rid of walls and claiming public space. So this was a kind of opening up and moving forward from a place of fear into something that was a much more public realm. Um, and as opposed to kind of a private one of escape and sanctuary to creating more um, public facing and inclusive kind of buildings. So whilst that line there, if you can see my arrow, that line there is the building line, the boundary line rather, that this whole area becomes a public covered walkway. So it's this thing about kind of giving back and bringing in that I think was really interesting. At the same time, we did a lot of, we didn't a lot, but we did a number of large houses. This is one in Westcliff, which is, um, I think for me, what's interesting about this is how the whole presentation was done. So you see up there is a little cover of the book, which is 1.2 meters long and 30 centimeters high. And you can see these are the pages as you open them. But what we did was up here on their tennis court, which is where the house was to be built, was a little pavilion. And we made this whole, so this is the booklet that they got to keep, but we made a whole exhibition with this model, et cetera, et cetera. We had eats, we had cocktails. And then we invited the clients to their own pavilion to take them through their house. So for me, it was very much this thing of how do you present architecture or but architecture is not just limited to this very strict drawing. I mean, in many ways, we've had commissions, done designs, done drawings, built buildings, which is quite a standard way of running a practice. But it's the intricacies of how that has developed. This is a drawing of uh, Petunia Clerko's house. This one of what's called House Altman Marsdorp, Leslie Marsdorp and how you can see how it's very integrated into the landscape. And then there was a series of these, what I called the sexy section houses. And they were a series of mostly second dwellings. Um, and they used corrugated iron, uh, brickwork that was plastered and left in the raw condition, um, steel doors and windows, and they kind of, and timber. S.A. Pine, S.A. Pawpaw, as we call it. And they kind of used that to stretch it. And they stretched, and these designs kind of stretched the, those materials to their kind of maximum. So with the cantilevers, with the, and how you got the maximum space out of the least amount of, of materials and space. This very wonderful 12-year period, which was really exciting, did eventually come to an end. And thank God for the World Cup, because we, well, we got the World Cup, which was sort of 2010, was two years after the rest of the world had sort of collapsed. South Africa's economy collapsed. So there's always this kind of link between what we're doing as architects and we're very kind of, um, and the economy, because we're very kind of affected by that and what's happening politically, what's happening climatically, et cetera. And, you know, no less than in our, in, in our practice. So the year of 2010, the kind of boom time at um, our lovely, crazy place in Melville came to an end and there was really no work. So we moved into what you'll find is called Slopey Cottage, which I'll show you just now. But there were five of us in this drawing office that was three meters wide by six meters long with a three by three meter space up at the top, oh, the other way around, three by three meter space up at the top. This is in the, the garden of the, of the house that Paris and I now live in. Um, but you can see here the details, how the materials are kind of used, how, but it was very small, we were very cramped and not very happy. And as I said, thank God for the football. There it is now, disappearing into the landscape of wild rocket, actually. And thank goodness for the 
interiors that we've done for my partner Paris, who is co-owner of Matchboxology. And um, they had also got a little bit smaller and we got to share their office space. And that is when Selma, Julianne, Nontlantla, Nicolette, Ben and Brendan, as well as briefly Unati came to work in our office. Claudia was still in our office, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's Shakira. And we took this part of the Matchboxology offices. Interestingly, we're doing a few drawings for them right now. And this is how the office looked before anyone moved in. Very kind of see-through, but yet there was private spaces like the boardroom in between. Um, and very similar to Lulu Kati Kati, which we were building at the time. But it was a great office and we had lots of fun here. We also did the competition with MRA for um, Anglo, which we won. And we built a number of houses. So there's always this kind of residential and pu public work that's going on um, in the practice. And um, once again, we were on the move. This time we went to stay in my little red house. Uh, still roughly the same practice size. And this was the little house that I saw was for sale. Well, at five in the morning, well, looking for our lost dogs. I saw this little gingerbread house as it was described. And we kind of restored part of it. And um, and the garden was a very important part of this. And it also became a time when I decided that everyone in the office should learn to grow at least sweet peas and probably vegetables. And you didn't need very much space. And so it was this whole kind of, our best farmer was Ben. Ben was the farmer deluxe, but it was also the little red house. So I took to drawing in red pen only. Um, and you can see this part was done later, but the part that we used as our studio was the, the actual house. That was the studio proper. That was my office, but like I could still see through to the studio because one thing that's always been very important for me is to be in the middle of the studio or, or in the same space as everybody else. So it's not this kind of cubicles that we all go off into. And in fact, when we've been in that sort of a way, it's been, we've barely been in it. So that's the kind of space where everybody worked around. There's one huge desk, very squashed with our lovely fireplace that kept us warm. And we were actually really happy in this little space. We had, see, lots of women, always lots of women in, in the practice over the years. Um, and then uh, we hadn't had a birthday for a while, so we had the blanket party and everybody got a lovely blanket. And we do know it's symbolism. And it was in this year, just 2013, um, it was the same year that my mother died, which is the same year that Jelan's father died. We did the Sophia Gray Memorial, and Jelan and I went to give the Jeffrey Barwer Memorial Lecture and uh, in Sri Lanka. So this is the very rough drawing of the uh, layout of the exhibition part. We made these um, vignettes of all the panels that would be of the various panels of all the projects. And so these were up on the walls, kind of covering all the walls, these big vinyl things that we still carry around with us. We can apparently eat lunch off. Anyway, with models of various buildings in front of them. And then these sculptures of the, um, what I call the um, constructions for self. So I'll show you those in a moment. This here is, apparently it's a dolly. There's Selma with Damon operating the dolly, so busy taking our little vignettes for today's movie. These are the different sculptures that are the constructions for self. That there is the uh, uh, Pineapple Republic, and inside there were these, these paintings, self-portrait by my granny. These paintings all painted by my granny, my mother, my sister, and I. The sculpture of the Lulukatikati, our little getaway in Utopia, the place where Paris and I live with the dog. 
and a kind of a idea of what was to be our later our studio. And then to Fourth Avenue Parkhurst. Again, the various people who worked in this office, a model, an elevation drawn by hand, this one, cut it in on Photoshop, and then one drawn on computer. And the drawing. So this is when the office became kind of fully riveted out. <laughs> oh. And um, it really took a long time to try and produce drawings that were nearly to my satisfaction because I'm so accustomed to the finesse of a hand drawing. This is the inside of our, our studio. Our Christmas in June, so we had an exhibition uh, of our work, trying to kind of attract more work, I guess. And then this is part of a really fun project we did, which was the interiors for this rural facility that we built. So our office became a kind of a warehouse. We then packed it all into this huge big truck. Well, it was packed into by these people and driven up to Wits Rural, where we over time um, set it all up. And this is Selma. And so we all came in my car with all the softs or the little things, the delicate things in the trailer, town and country behind us. Some experiment they were doing with wet toilet paper, fascinating, whatever it was. And then some of the guys who help us set up. Always the creatures. So you'll see they're always coming through. Um, and then um, just there have been very few models, but they've played an incredibly important role. And this was a very interesting project, which was Nandipa Mutambo's studio, which is a drawing that Selma did. And then Selma was very engaged with the contractors or with um, the builders on site. So ordering materials and acting as kind of manager of the site, which I think was a really exciting project. And also, while we were at that house, this project for Eugenio and Nicole, Eugenio being Italian, Nicole American. And it was so interesting because, you know, often you get these commissions to do houses and you get this like good taste grey. And, and it was just such a relief to have people who just wanted, I don't know, brightness and joy and colour. And um, it was lovely. And then also during this period was the, the I suppose, sort of first, the, the office building that we did for Law and Keys and how that then became that kind of whole thing with landscape and planting. And I love this picture because the whole building has kind of almost been gobbled up by the plants and sort of disappears into this. And that was that team. We were on holiday. We did a an uh, office party at Wittklipfontein, which is Xavier's building out in the Friedewater area. And then along came that horrid COVID and the remote working. So this was kind of the core office at the time. That was my office for the first part of COVID with this incredible view, naturally the mask making. And then the office for the second part of COVID, and it seemed forever and ever with my creatures, only these ones alive, which is fabulous. And that was also the time that we made these two movies of um, for the for the presentation for from when I became president of the institute. I'm not showing you the movies; they are on the internet, but they were incredible. The COVID was a complete downer and these making of these movies and the offices, nobody anywhere to speak to, et cetera, et cetera. These movies were an incredible way of kind of, we all kind of came together in, in making of them. It was also a time when these little books, together with this drawing, which I'm sure you all have heard or seen of, with Fred Swartz, very clever, reading of these became our website. So you kind of see how that works. Um, so that drawing then became the kind of icons that represent the different projects. And we're not going to go through each and every part, and we are. Okay, so then this one, 
which is the stuff page, which I love, and the little chickens walking along the bottom. Um, so try not to show you pictures of buildings, but the other things that we're interested in. Then back to the studio, and this was during COVID, and I think we had one meeting in this building. Um, but we moved the whole practice in. That was it before we moved in. And this is, it should be slides, there we go, of the making of that structure, which was in the same little red house in the outbuildings and how that became our studio. But it was really perfectly made for us, but we only ever really had one meeting in it. It was quite tragic. And then I was offered an offer I couldn't refuse and so I sold it, but I still... And here you see the sculpture from the Sophia Gray and the gardening that continued. And then finally we became mm, long after, well, co from COVID we went to stay at 44 Stanley. And at one stage it was only Selma who used to go to the office. Um, and it's now the four of us in the office. That is the the truck again, bringing things, make the office, get a space. And here's the very wild drawing that we did to make that space. The pretty picture, sort of more honest image of our working space. It's quite a pretty one. Um, and this is Lele into that cabinet that I pointed out to you right in the beginning that became a pink one with all the hand drawings. And Lele has now been going through these and um, starting an archive. And in this building, we've done a lot of work for Vitz um, Gatehouse, that's what that is, um, the project at Origins, and uh, Food Sanctuary. And this here is, is a building that Pancho actually had I think he did the whole building and then this give light building which is a very special project that we did it's um it's it's a kind of orphanage I guess but it's a home really um and just so you don't think we never build models they are models and then part of the, the this year which was sort of the being at 44 Stanley was certainly the Venice Biennale and just an idea of how we would put together um, a presentation. We also did the rebound house, and that's Lele and I painting the gate. We recently involved in this project, which is up in Falwater, and trying and, and once again building models and kind of getting energy back into drawings. But 44 Stanley is coming to an end, and we're going to be moving to Melville, which is a full circle for me. Um, now to the uh, Bamboo Centre, actually. And I'm hoping that hand making will continue to be very much hand making, gardening, and my love for pottery will continue to be very much part of our future. Thank you. Finito. From Thank you so much, Kate. What a, what a fascinating tour through a uh, fascinating practice that was really quite extraordinary and I, I think um, my feelings are being shared by the numerous um, hands of applause that are going up um, but at this point um, we will have questions and um, any comments uh, there are a few comments that people have made um, John Bezinos says so excited to see hand-drawn drawings again so much more oomph and Yolanda van der Weyver, sorry, I forget my pronunciation, says, what an inspiration, want to start hand drawings again tomorrow. So um, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions or anything that they'd like to ask uh, Kate directly, but this is a, a, good, a good moment. But um, while we're waiting for those, I'm, I'm gonna ask um, Kate about hand drawings and um, the extent to which you, you use hand drawings now. Do you? Do you, can you talk about your process of working in your office? Do you? So I can only do hand drawings. I mean, I can somehow find my way around InDesign. I can do a PowerPoint presentation. 
and I am surprised at my skill actually on a computer. But but by and large, for me, my medium is hand drawing, hand drawing, making, etc. What the computer does is kind of so I will always do a design that is in is drawn by hand. It then gets kind of translated onto a computer, back into hand, back onto a computer. So for me, that is a very important process, and I think. Um, there's a connection between the brain and the hand and the tactileness of that that I think is um, unsurpassed, to be honest. Um, and I think that computers are very useful for all kinds of things, but I think that they also... One of the things that I have... Um, in fact, I've discussed it quite a bit with Julianne, and the problem of a computer is that you're never drawing... Um, you're never drawing with an understanding of scale. So, for example, we had a discussion in the office. Shall I print this at 1 in 20 or 1 in 25? And my obvious thing is 1 in 20 because I know 1 centimeter is 200 millimeters. Or, you know, 1 in 100 because the centimeter is a meter. And I can see that. If I look at a drawing, I can tell you what scale it is. I could draw you a thing that was to scale with a scale ruler because I have an understanding of scale. And you never have that on a computer. So, for example, if you're going to do also, if you're going to do a working drawing, you have to have an understanding of the size of the working drawing before you can place it on a page so that you don't land up running out of page or you've got this little squirt down in the bottom left hand corner and what to do with the rest of the page. And I think that there's a, a kind of a lost in translation that uh, computers are incredibly useful. They do amazing things, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that there is an enormous brain to page connection and brain to space, to imagining space, that is an incredibly important thing that drawing gives you that, um, uh, yeah, I think I will always do. And it's also not just drawing, it's also making. So making models, I do a lot of making. I sew, I garden, I potter, I do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, a, it's not limited to just drawing. Thank you for that. And um, there's a question here. Um, before we go to the question, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that thing about hand drawing. And um, I was actually speaking to Angeland today and we were thinking about maybe um, suggesting that for a period of time students only worked with their with by hand that they sort of move away from um, relying so much on digital means of representation and so many uh, comments are coming up I mean, i'll read a few more what a presentation i enjoyed this so much from veronica bernard um lemma saying thank you very very much moving and touching uh yusuf brilliant kate the tumaleng hand drawings are architecture Motso, such a diverse body of work, splendid. And um, they ask, are you able to share a bit more about the work you did for the Biennale, the concept? Uh, there's actually, there's been quite a lot kind of written about it and etc. But the, uh, the concept of the piece that we did for the Biennale is that it tells a story. It tells a story of a kind of ancient history. So it's about of, of Johannesburg, of the place that most of our work takes place. And um, it can be a long explanation, but I'm not going to do that. It, and what it is, is the story of how the meteorite came, created this uh, great explosion, and how that uh, caused the gold to be in these deep seams, and that kind of was the start of, of Johannesburg. But the reading is is on many different layers. So... It's a topographical one. It's also a social, socio-political one. Um, and it's kind of the, the, the piece that is the tapestry is around the kind of topogra topographical reading. And the beadwork is about um, the, the extraction of gold. But instead of having that go off to... Um, outside of the country that we claim it as ours as an African piece and an African necklace to adorn the body. Um, it's also about shadow that reflects this pattern on the ground, which is the story of the geological reading, if you like, that is below the surface. Um, 
And I think very importantly that it is all made by hand and by women. And um, so the patterns, the color, the three dimensionality of the piece is very much a representation of, of our work. And that is the sort of seriously brief summary. Um, the, we did present it a couple of weeks back. I think you were all too busy watching GSA shows to come to that, that one, but it is online. So yes, it was a wonderful process. Thank you. Um, there's actually a hand up from Lemasea. If you'd like to turn on your mic and your camera so we can see you and ask your question. Hello, Kate. You don't know me. Um, I've never had an opportunity to meet with you, but I work with Ben. I worked with him before he went and worked with you, and I work with him still. So the question I wanted to ask you is, is about your, you're telling a, an interesting, intricate number of stories. And I also like the fact that as you are drawing them, it's not just the colors, it's not just the forms, um, but there's a story that you are telling behind that. And uh, I'm liking the creatures that seemingly keep following you. And I wonder, just wonder whether, um, what would happen if you made the decision to just tell the story, let's say, not in a book, but maybe in a graphic book, um, a whole graphic novel about why the animals and how they came to live with you and why are they following you all along and also intriguing enough to figure out how they speak to your spaces, how do they influence your colors, how, how they tell. I'm, I'm just curious, what, would, what, what if you were to pick a, a medium like a comic, how you would do that? And I'll tell you why I say that. Um, as much as I've never met you, um, there's a comic that I read once. It sits as part of something called Heavy Metal, which is an independent um, publishing outfit. And they published a comic which was called Ghetto Nine Dayak. And it's based on a dystopian Nigerian environment. Um, and the basis of it was a plague came and it meant that it ravaged the world and there were only two white men living in a sea of very black people in Africa. And this character called Dayak was part of that. And the images that they were painting in these drawings reminds me a lot of the things that you draw in the images and the snakes and the retelling of animals of myth uh, that somehow find expression in buildings, found expressions in roads, found expressions in communities and spaces, in power stations, in, in stuff civic and also stuff personal but also impacting stories. I'm just curious what you would say about that. Um, I actually missed the beginning, but I'll talk to that. So pleased to meet you and thank you for your, it, it's not particularly a question, but more kind of commentary. And I think that um, storytelling is very much kind of African tradition, I think. And I think that as um, architects, when we engage with our projects as a way of kind of describing them as a way of including others in the process of, of experiencing them, of um, being part of, of those, that I think a story is a way and a, 
of how to enter it. So even if the story is told um, perhaps with fewer creatures, because I think there are a lot of people who are scared of all the creatures, but um, or, or that there are ways that you can engage people rather than being, there's something around it being a, a, how to make architecture more accessible, which I think has been incredibly important. For me, there's also the world is kind of bigger than than this kind of, uh, you know, there is something of a fantasy that that exists, and um, that you know our, our imaginations can be set free. So I think that the creatures are really friends. They're not necessarily about weird and wonderful things, although I suppose they are. But what I'm trying to say is, it's not a sort of whirlwind of snakes. Those have kind of moved along, and we've kind of moved into other things, and it's a way of telling a story, I guess. Don't know if that really answers it. Well, I think that was, a good, that was a good response, Kate. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat from Kennedy Chikarema, and he asks, absolutely amazing and a beautiful lecture. Thank you so much, Kate. I have a question. How are you able to stay true to your current train of thought and practice, practice in the ever-changing world and pace of architecture. Gosh, uh, I mean, I think that's that's extremely difficult. I mean, I have to say that that following from COVID and illness that I had, etc., that it's been a very difficult thing to kind of get back up and running at the same kind of amount of energy. Um, and I think that we are living in particularly a country that is in a very difficult situation in a world that's also quite um, devastating, I suppose. And I, it's difficult to kind of how to to move out of that and, and into doing wonderful and creative things. But I think that that as architects is our role. And we have to find the things that inspire us um, and in a way, those are the challenges that we need to face in order to um, kind of lead, I don't know if that's the right word, but to bring people with us in what are our imaginaries and our um, yes, spaces and ideas. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but it, it isn't always. So I think there's an ebb and a flow, and certainly I've tried to explain that in in the practice and in the de describing of the practice. And, um, you, you know, you have tough times and uh, unusual and interesting things happen. And I guess you've just, you've got to find ways of reigniting and re-inspiring and it ain't easy right now. It is very tricky. It's a very difficult space that I don't know, but a lot of us, I think, find ourselves in. Um, yeah. Thank you for that, Kate. Um, and a comment from Lone Paulson, um, another GSA friend. And um, Lone says, thank you for the trip down memory lane, feeling quite emotional. Great reflective presentation and an affirmation of the conceptual energy and enthusiasm you always put into your work, an inspiration to current students to feel what you are doing. Thank you for that, Lo. Uh, and a question from Hans, and Hans asks, maybe you would like to speak a bit about using gum poles. Is Hans actually Hans? <laughs> no, because maybe it was Hans that wanted to ask us and we couldn't see their face. Um, uh, I can't see anybody. Um, uh, so, gum poles for me are are a, are a fantastic. Uh, they are fantastic, and through the work you'll see that gum poles are used in various ways. What's amazing about a gum pole is that it is a it's a circle, so all the pressure is coming equally. It's a tree, so you get a trunk, you get a full trunk, you don't get a cut up trunk or a bit of a trunk, you get a whole trunk. And um, it's it's the kind of flexibility or the opportunity and the energy that, that it 
innately possesses. Um, I think for me has been it's been a fascinating thing to kind of use gun poles in all kinds of ways. You get very skinny ones and you can do latter or you can do things that kind of create shadow or screens. They can be very big as as in the Ludicati building where they are each of them weighed the like half a ton each had to get brought in with cranes and they hold up the whole building. So they're an incredible um, yeah, it's been there sometimes they're never decorative. They're always doing some work in in the building. And um yeah, I've I've used a lot of them and really liked them. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Kate. And a few more compliments. You are a pure artist, very creative, wonderful from Jacobus Scott. And um two questions here from Kimal, a JSA student, I believe. Um and Kimal says, hi, Kate, thank you for your insightful lecture. I have two practice questions. And uh, we, we've asked uh, our students actually to undertake some work around their envisioning their own practice. So I think this question is coming from curiosity around that. And I'll ask the first question and then I'll ask, ask the second one um, after you've answered the first. So the first question is, how has your business structure evolved over time to support your growth and success? That's the first question. business structure evolved over time to support your growth and success? Very randomly. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know I was probably not supposed to give an answer like that. But um, it, it, it's quite fluid and it changes according to the amount of work that you do or don't have, the kind of interests that you have. Um, and um, well, at any given moment in time, amazingly, when I thought I would have a much quieter practice when Paloma was born, it kind of exploded. And um, so I think you kind of, it, it's, a, it's a response to what is happening rather than it is, and certainly for me, I mean, it is very much an intuitive thing. It's not something, you know, I was asked like, how did you know how to start a practice? And to be very honest, I didn't know how to start a practice. I didn't even think about that. I just started a practice. And it's a kind of a thing where you, yeah, it evolves over time and you become more and more confident and competent in it. I mean, I have to say the number of times that I've thought that I should just run because I'm terrified. It's close to month end and what am I going to do? That certainly has been numerous. But I think um, the, uh, there's another driving force that is about making amazing buildings that just has, yeah, got an energy of its own. Great, thank you. Um, the second question from Kemal is, do clients appreciate the hand drawings and artworks or are these used more for process internally? Good question. I think that's a lovely question. And um, uh, clearly, historically, there were only drawings, hand drawings, and so that was what was anticipated. Um, but I think that hand drawings are always, it, it's about what the end product is, and, and they're incredibly beautiful. There's a kind of an energy around it that I think um, is what clients love, actually. Um, I don't know how they'd feel about working drawings done by hand, but maybe if they were done on a, I was thinking freehand, but maybe if they were done on a drawing board, I can't see why that would be, be an issue. I think that, you know, if you, um, like if I draw a long straight line, client is sort of gobsmacked, like how did you do that? So I think there's an amazing, um, I, I think that clients are very inclined towards a hand drawing. I, I think there's a, even if they don't know if it is a hand drawing or not a hand drawing, I think there's an energy in a drawing that they will perceive. That's easier to get from a hand drawing, actually. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and a comment from Fanny Jacobs. She said, ideas don't come from outer space and crash into the drawing board. The pen and paper is a tool to make the world see what you see 
or for you to see what you think before you've even seen it, and probably the best preliminary platform for me to immediately discover new possibilities, outcomes, and a gateway to visualize and experience new propositions toward the design as it develops. The power of the connection between the mind and the pen or pencil are endless. It's a nice reflection on what you presented. And we have two more questions, and I think we'll close with these two. Um, one is from Kalisi Makuba, one, one of our uh, faculty here. And, and Kalisi asks, um, he says, thank you for a lovely presentation. I love the drawings, particularly those of work in progress. You seem to have managed to build an office with staff, both present and past, who share similar values in practice. What would you say is your management style? And how do you see the role of staff with their own personal professional aspirations in carrying and sustaining your agenda? And that's a very interesting question. And I think um, particularly and quite, quite uh, difficult to answer. I sort of almost want you to ask the people who've worked in my office or are working in my office to answer that. Um, but I think that, uh, you, you know, I mean, there's some things that were always sort of said as a joke when I interview people. But, you, you know, you can't be like no prima donnas, the position is already taken. But um, um, uh, kind of understanding that you're part of a team, that the um, it's a very personal thing. I think that running, in, in fact, despite the fact we were nine people at one spent, uh, time in place, generally speaking, it's a very small practice that's sort of anywhere between it, it sort of mostly has been five, quite often seven, but it's often less than five people. You have a very close and intimate time together. So I think it is, it's also intuitive about who is hired and who's not hired and who comes to be in the office. And I think there's definitely, you know, people are not going to come and be interviewed for a position in our office. Um, without having an idea about what we are about. And I think that's really important. And when I say it's intuitive, like you can get a sense of somebody and that's kind of important about when you, so that the relationships are intimate, we're all working on the same thing or to the same goal. And I think that's very important in who comes into the office is really important. There's the incredible trust also. Um, in kind of, uh, you, you know, I mean, that we rely on each other to produce what needs to be produced. And, you know, if you're having a bad hair day, well, we'll take it for a bit, but actually you must get on with it. You know, it's like, it's about a relationship with people, I think, is, is for, for me, probably one of the most important parts of running a practice, whether it's people who work for you, people who are, working in the making of the building, the client, whoever that might be, like those relationships are really what I think this work is all around. Thank you for that. And then um, final question from Jessica Ntali, who's a student, master's student here at the GSA. And Jessica says, hi, Kate, thank you for the refreshing presentation. My question is, what is are some of the key qualities you look out for when hiring architectural staff? or when you are looking to collaborate with a particular team? <laughs> She's planning on coming for an interview. Um, what's the question again? What are the key things I look for? She says, hi, Kate. Thank you for the refreshing. But my question is, what are some of the key qualities you look out for when hiring architectural staff or when you are looking to collaborate with a particular team? So what are the qualities you look for in staff and also in collaborating with the team? I think curiosity is a very important um, it's so difficult because I think everybody is different. And I think that um, but an openness, I think, is important. I think a curiousness is important. Um, and, you know, life is larger than architecture, I think, is also a very important adage. Um, to many of us as architects, we think that life is architecture, which might also be true. But the, you know, 
the opposite is also true. So I think those are very difficult questions to answer. And I think that it is, as I was saying before, quite an intuitive thing. There must be a reason why you called or offered your CV or whatever it was. And yeah, hopefully I'm going to find that or read that or know that, yeah. No, I think that, I think there's a nice answer to the three three really interesting questions, and you know you I think the first question you answered is is, is intuition, you know, in terms of your um, idea of values and your management style. And you've spoken about curiosity, intuition, curiosity, and openness, and I think those are all words that perhaps describe the the character and the nature of the work that you've shared with us this evening. So I, I want to thank you so much for putting together what was a really wonderful presentation. And I can see from the responses that we've had today uh, and by the sheer number of people who attended today, how appreciative um, the audience has been. So thank you so much, Kate. I think everybody really, really enjoyed it. I certainly did. And I know everybody present uh, has indicated their appreciation. So thank you. So uh, from my side, a real pleasure. And I think that, you know, as always in, in preparing a presentation, I have never given a presentation like this before, and I've never given this presentation. And it's been this wonderful, I mean, that image of Lele opening up the, the cabinet and bringing out the drawings. This has been going on for a couple of weeks now. And there's something totally thrilling. It has been, as Lone said, my own travel down memory lane. And just this wonderful excitement about the energy in all of this work that's happened over quite a long period of time. So maybe when somebody was asking, how do you, you know, keep it all going and get inspired, go and look back at what you've done, because it's incredibly powerful. Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Yeah, lovely. Thanks again, Kate. Um, I, I think, you know, what's been really interesting is the first time we ran this series of practice lectures and we asked architects to talk about their practice, the majority of them still, in a, in a way, gave, present. I guess, what I would call conventional presentations of their, their practice. But... This year, um, we've, we've really spoken about wanting to look inside the practice to understand what the motivations are, you know, to see inside the practices. And I think this has been really successful. And I think when we first spoke about this, you described it as having a look under the bonnet. And it really, I think we really got a good look inside your um, engine and how you work. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and just to remind everybody um, that next week, um, we should be having um, the um, sixth lecture in this series. Uh, it's the final one of the series. Um, uh, Fred hasn't produced the poster for it yet, but he will do soon and it'll be um, shared. It's by Vidal Dowding, who's an architect from Jamaica. He's actually a former student of mine at the Caribbean School of Architecture and has a really quite extraordinary practice. And I'm looking forward um, to seeing Vidal's presentation uh, next week. And um, that will be the last um, of the series of the practice series this year. It's definitely something that we're going to be continuing next year, um, looking at and getting insight into practices, both at international and looking and having a look inside and seeing how those practices work. And I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Big thanks to, to Kate and also thank you for um, Boitamelo and Chinea and Ops for always being behind the scenes and making these things so successful. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and look forward to seeing you next week.